Yes. For us. Yes. Oh. Oh, you mean the the jet algorithm? Yeah, yeah, the jet. Yeah. Sorry. So, so what's supposed to be going on is that you have um, e plus e minus producing a quark and a quark pair. And then these guys have a very large invariant mass. So let's write um, yij is equal to pi plus pj squared over q squared. So if I compute that for these particles, it's 1. If, the, um, if one of those quarks radiates a gluon, and I compute it for these particles, it's less than 1. If the gluons then split, it's even smaller. Well, it doesn't have to be smaller, but to get take advantage of this logarithmic divergence, it has to be smaller than this virtuality, and so on. Okay. So now what, what happens is, and then eventually um, these various pieces here will organize themselves and turn into some mesons. So you'll have eventually some pions in the final state. Now what you would really like to do is to build the chain back up. Of course, you don't really know how to do that. So you just have to make the best guess at how you would do that. And it seems to me that a reasonable thing to do is to take all the pions and find the pair with the minimum value of this quantity and combine them. So if I now combine these two pions into a kind of meta track, which has the sum of the momenta, then I get a diagram with fewer particles. And then maybe I'll combine these two, and I'll get another diagram with even fewer particles. Now, the idea is that this is kind of a model of what's going on the other way at the quark-gluon level. And maybe when this, these masses here get well above 1 GeV, that's actually accurate. OK? Yeah. That's right. Uh, that's right, but they all kind of work in this way, that you make some arbitrary choice. Now, in principle, you could do the same thing here. I could do perturbative QCD, get, I, I could, you know, if I'm very powerful, I could do this perturbative QCD calculation exactly. I could get some array of partons, and I apply the JET algorithm to those partons. And so the claim is that the JET algorithm applied to the partons should give you a value very close to the jet algorithm applied to the hadrons. Okay, so if I apply the jet algorithm to the partons, it may tell me to combine these guys rather than these guys. Right, but, um, but that's fine. Okay. Um, the, a key thing is that the jet algorithm should be defined in such a way that it's so-called infrared safe. That is that there are lots of infrared singularities that I'm generating here. And the variable that I'm using shouldn't be excessively sensitive to those infrared singularities. So we could talk a little more about that offline. But there are some jet algorithms that are good from that point of view and some that are not. The ones that are not, you can't actually compute their consequences in perturbative QCD. So uh, unfortunately, CDF and D0 are, are kind of historically chose infrared unsafe algorithms, and that makes it a little hard to analyze their data with precision. OK. OK, any other questions? OK, we're now done the part of the course that deals with perturbative QCD. But um, maybe I should just make some announcements in case you guys would like to learn a little more about this stuff. Um, the first is that I put, actually today, I put on the archive 
a set of pedagogical lecture notes on perturbative QCD that kind of do the next chapter after what I did in the class. So um, these are kind of these are some fancy methods for computing uh, multi-particle tree graphs in QCD. And so if any of you are curious, that's the archive number. Um, the second thing is that this afternoon, while I'm here, I'm supposed to give two physics department colloquia. The first one is this afternoon at 4. Um, I'm going to give a general introduction to LHC physics at the physics department in Waterloo. And next Wednesday, I'm supposed to give the colloquium here. And that'll be, um, if you like, the more advanced course on QCD at the LHC. And the title of that one, which you probably already saw, is Stampede of the Wild Gluons. So, um, oh, it's fine. If you're interested in this stuff, that's available. Okay. Um, this will be the last lecture on QCD. But there's one more thing that I really need to tell you about QCD, which doesn't have to do with the quark gluon level. It has to do with the strong interaction level. And that is that QCD has some symmetries that I haven't talked about yet which are actually uh, very important and whose um, realization in nature gives also some more tests of the basic structure of QCD. So you folks remember, I wrote down a couple days ago the QCD Lagrangian. The sum over quark flavors, the gauge invariant coupling to an SU2 young mills theory, SU3, young Mills theory, please excuse me. And then we could also write quark mass terms. QF, QF bar, MF, where these quark masses are in principle different for each flavor. And all of the, um, the symmetries of the hadron spectrum, uh, for example, isospin symmetry, are somehow connected to the values of these quark mass terms. And so now I'd like to be a little more precise about that. Um, what are actually the symmetries of this Lagrangian? So <coughs> an interesting thing to do is to consider the limit where the quark mass terms go to zero. And then the Lagrangian has higher symmetry. And then what we can do is turn on the quark, turn the quark masses back on and see how that symmetry is broken, to what extent it's broken. Maybe this is a, I should say, this is a good approximation for F equals UDS. The charm quark already has a mass of about a GeV. So the charm quark mass is a mass scale where QCD is asymptotically free. It's weakly coupled. However, these guys live in a regime where QCD is strongly coupled. And so what I'd like to do is just consider the consequences of taking the UD and S to be massless. And then we'll try and turn the masses back on and see what happens. OK, if I do that, then this theory has a number of symmetries. First of all, if I ignore the masses of UD and S, then UD and S are on the same footing in this Lagrangian. So there are um, unitary transformations which uh, mix UD and S arbitrarily. And those are, if I again ignore this term, those are manifestly symmetries of the kinetic term here. But there's one more set of symmetries, which is also uh, quite interesting. You remember that in gauge theories, the kinetic term separates into a left-handed piece and a right-handed piece that don't talk to each other. So I could actually write this first term as QL I sigma bar QL plus QR I sigma bar dot del QR. And now I could think about two transformations. 
one of which is a unitary transformation on the left-handed piece. The other one is a separate unitary transformation on the right-handed quarks. As long as I ignore the mass term, there's no apparent communication between the left-handed and right-handed quarks. So actually, both of these unitary transformations independently are symmetries of this Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian has a U3 cross U3 global symmetry. And if you don't mind, I'm going to separate out the U1 part. So I'm going to write that as U1 cross SU3 cross U1 cross SU3. And then we can write down the, uh, the currents for these various pieces in the following way. Um, if I take UL to be equal to UR, that corresponds to a transformation. Q goes to e to the i, let's say, alpha a, t a on Q, where t is a, um, just an SU3 matrix. And the corresponding current for this is Q bar gamma mu Q. Oh, sorry. Please excuse me. I meant to distinguish the U1 part. So if I take UL equals UR, I have these two symmetries. Q goes to e to the i alpha Q, for which the current is J mu is Q bar gamma mu Q. And Q goes to e to the i beta A T A Q, for which the current is Q bar gamma mu T A Q. So T A here is an SU3 global matrix that acts on the three column, this column vector UDS. So this is U1 and SU3. Now I could also take UL to be the opposite of UR. In that case, I want to rotate the left-handed quarks one way and the right-handed quarks the other way. And that's a perfectly good symmetry of this Lagrangian. And then, again, there are two pieces. Q goes to e to the i gamma. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't use that. That's right, alpha gamma 5. Remember, gamma 5 is plus 1 on the right-handed states, and it's minus 1 on the left-handed states. So this does exactly that. The current here is Q bar gamma mu gamma 5 Q. And then I can also do an SU3 transformation. And the current here is Q bar gamma mu gamma 5 TAQ. So I have a set of actually 16 currents, which are the currents of a U1 cross SU3 cross U1 cross SU3. So these are called, these are vector currents. These have an extra gamma 5. Gamma 5 gives you an extra minus 1 over parity, on under parity. So these are called the axial vector currents. Yes? What's that U, L, and U, Sorry? They're defined by these equations. OK. OK. So now we can try to identify these currents with symmetries in nature. I mean, if this is the true Lagrangian of the strong interactions, these currents ought to be identified with some symmetries that we would observe in nature. So U1 is barrier. And the conservation of this current is the conservation of baryon number. And so far, I haven't put anything into the Lagrangian that would violate baryon number, which is good, because I told you that baryon number in nature is an extremely good symmetry. Uh, or rather, baryon number conservation in nature is an extremely well-preserved conservation. This, corresponding to this current, is the global SU3 symmetry of the Hadron spectrum. And that's not an exact symmetry, but 
it's not so strongly violated, as you guys know from looking in the particle data book. Hadrons organize themselves into SU3 multiplets. Um, if we think about the strange quark as being a little heavier than the other quarks, uh, then up and down, that explains the splittings in those multiplets. The other splittings are electromagnetic. They're only a few MeV. So, um, and then maybe I should say this contains isospin SU2. So isospin is a very good symmetry of the strong interactions, accurate at the few percent level. SU3 is valid at the, oh, 10 or 15 percent level. And um, it's easy to imagine that if I took the quark masses to zero, or maybe I made the quark masses all equal for U, D, and S, that that would be something that would be a reasonable description of the data on hadron spectroscopy that we see. Now, then there are these other two guys, which, however, um, do not seem to be realized on the hadron spectrum. So first of all, let me deal with this um, U1 axial current. The U1 axial current, let me just tell you, there's a story about that that I won't have time to discuss. But the simple uh, statement of that story is that the U1 axial current has a matrix element to two gluons that comes from these diagrams. So when you compute those diagrams, you find that they're actually, so classically, this current is conserved. But when you compute those diagrams, it turns out that there's something on the right-hand side, which is epsilon mu nu lambda sigma, f mu nu, f lambda sigma, times uh, g squared over some constant, which is associated with the values of these diagrams. And so actually, this current here is not conserved in the presence of gluons. And then actually what happens is that, that when you consider these gluons in the strong interactions, this current gets completely annihilated. So as a result of quantum effects, this is called the, um, goes under the name of the axial vector anomaly. And that's a somewhat advanced topic in quantum field theory. So um, you can ask me about that privately. We won't have time to explain it here. But the, the effect of that quantum correction is that this symmetry and current get completely annihilated. So we don't have to worry about it. Now, what about this last line? This last line here is called chiral SU3. Again, chiral is another word for something that's odd under parity. If I put this T matrix in this vertex, the trace of T is zero. And so these diagrams vanish. So the problem I explained up here for the U1 part is not a problem. And these symmetries are actually good symmetries of the QCD Lagrangian in the limit of zero mass. So we have to take them seriously. On the other hand, these symmetries don't seem to have any connection at all to the Hadron spectrum. Um, these are symmetries that relate particles of even parity to particles of odd parity. But if you think about the Hadron spectrum, you can see that if there's a particle of even parity, um, if there's a particle of odd parity, like the pion or the rho, and you look over on the other side for particles of even parity, there aren't any mesons of even parity. In the baryons, the, there's the 8 and the 10, which have even parity, but there are no odd parity baryons except much higher in the spectrum. And so this symmetry is demonstrably not a symmetry of the hadron spectrum of strong interactions. So the question is, does that mean that we have to throw away the QCD Lagrange? And the answer, of course, is no, but I need to explain to you how it works. OK. So now, there's something also which is odd about this symmetry, which is that 
a chiral symmetry like this that treats left and right differently, um, the mass term is not invariant under that. And so this term really manifestly forbids mass terms for all the fermions in the theory, not just the quarks, but also the proton. And intuitively, you might say, if you have strong interactions, the quarks are going to get together and bind and form bound states. And so the strong interactions must annihilate any symmetry that forbids the generation of mass for, for bound states. And in the strong interactions, there's a very specific way you can understand that, which I'd now like to discuss. So if I wrote the QCD Lagrangian, again, ignoring the mass term for UD and S quarks, and I constructed the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian would have some matrix elements that come from gluon exchange. And the typical kinds of matrix elements you're used to thinking about are something like this, where I have a quark and an antiquark, let's say, bound by the exchange of a gluon or a quark and a quark uh, repelled, or actually they can even be attracted by the exchange of a gluon. However, there are other terms in the Hamiltonian that look like this or like this, which involve pair creation and annihilation. We're in quantum field theory, after all. Um, we're allowed to create and annihilate quark-antiquark pairs. Um, In the, so we're allowed to create and annihilate quark-antiquark -quark pairs. We're working in the limit where the quarks are treated as having zero mass. And so it doesn't actually cost you any energy to create a quark-antiquark -quark pair. They're massless. You could just pop them out of the vacuum. And now the following statement becomes very interesting. If I think about these matrix elements, or matrix elements like this, which are off diagonal in the number of quarks, which are allowed to create and annihilate pairs of quarks and antiquarks, those matrix elements ha are non-zero if I have a non-zero content of quarks and antiquarks in the ground state. And so it's interesting to just diagonalize this Hamiltonian. It doesn't cost me much energy, so there's small diagonal elements when I create a quark and antiquark pair. On the other hand, if the QCD coupling constant is strong, which it is for low momentum transfer, I have large off-diagonal elements that I can benefit from to lower the energy of the vacuum. And so very naturally then, the vacuum of QCD for sufficiently strong coupling in, in this QCD gauge theory will fill up with quark-antiquark -quark pairs. This is very similar to what happens in the theory of superconductivity. And in fact, in a, the, the set of ideas came about, basically, um, especially from uh, Yoichiro and Nambu, when people understood the theory of superconductivity. And Nambu was one of the first to understand that you could apply those same ideas in the strong interactions. And so, what we have then is a kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking. I'll make that a little more explicit in a moment. These diagrams induce spontaneous symmetry breaking of this symmetry, this set of symmetries. And that has some very specific consequences for the way the strong interactions are realized that I'd like to work out in the rest of this lecture. So the first question is, um, well, you guys have taken statistical mechanics from Kadanoff, right? The, the, whenever there's spontaneous symmetry breaking, the first question you ask is, what is the order <coughs> parameter? So I'd like to try and explain to you what the order parameter is. And then from there, we'll go on and develop all the consequences. OK, so what is a, if I, can, if I have quarks and antiquarks, and they're bound up, and they, there are pairs of them in the vacuum, 
and I condense a large number of quark-antiquark -quark pairs into the vacuum of QCD, what do those pairs look like? Well, there's a fairly simple picture that you can draw. Every pair has to have a quark and an antiquark. It has to have zero momentum. And it has to have zero angular momentum. We don't want to break translational invariance, and we don't want to break Lorentz invariance. So please notice what's going on here. This guy here is a right-handed quark, but this guy over here is a right-handed antiquark. But remember that the right-handed antiquark is the antiparticle of the left-handed quark. So what that means is that the vacuum condensate of pairs hooks up the left-handed part of the quark field and the right-handed part of the quark field in a specific orientation. And that goes exactly against this symmetry here, whose essence is that we can do SU3 rotations on the left-handed quark fields and the right-handed quark fields independently. So if I condense these pairs, I'm going to break all of these symmetries. And that will be spontaneous symmetry breaking. So it'll have some consequences that actually you folks have learned about in a general context. Well, I'm just going to make them more specific here. OK, well, what is the order parameter? Now we can write that down. Um, there are basically, uh, let me consider just u and d for the moment for simplicity. There are four kinds of pairs that I can write down. I can write down the up quark with the anti-up quark. And these can either both be left-handed or both be right-handed. And if these guys are condensed into the vacuum, I should write the operator that destroys those pairs. And that operator is u bar u, which is equal to u dagger left, u right, plus u dagger right, u left. This, again, is a scalar operator. It's got zero um, Lorentz quantum numbers, so an expectation for that will preserve Lorentz invariance. Similarly, I can do the same thing with the down quark, and if I want, also with the strange quark. And so what I claim is that the order parameter so the order parameter for the symmetry breaking is that um, q bar f, q f in the vacuum state is not equal to. OK. So um, and typically, this gets some name. Let's call it minus delta. And um, this is not summed over f. Presumably, for each quark flavor, independently, the same thing happens. There's the same minimum of the potential, and I get the same vacuum expectation value, as long as I ignore all the masses. So this is now the spontaneous. So what I claim, then, is that this symmetry is not realized on the Hadron spectrum. Because actually, it's spontaneously broken. The physics is the physics of pair condensation into the vacuum. So it's very similar to the physics of superconductivity. The one problem, the, the main difference between this and superconductivity, for those of you who are taking John Berlinski's course, is that in QCD, there's no Fermi surface. The Fermi surface, instead of being uh, a big Fermi surface, is just the tip of the cone for massless particles. And so um, whereas superconductivity occurs for any attractive coupling constant, no matter how small, in QCD, you actually need to have a finite, strong coupling constant in order for this to be the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Nevertheless, with asymptotic freedom, the QCD coupling gets as strong as you like eventually. So probably this is bound to happen. OK. Well. 
Now that I have that formula, what I'd like to do is to um, generalize this formula uh, just slightly. So let me write this formula a little more carefully in the following way. Q, F, Q bar, let me um, write I and J. So now I and J are U, D, and S. And let me write left and right here. And this would now be consistent with this formula, minus a half delta delta J. So this expression is exactly equivalent to this expression. The vacuum of QCD is parity invariant. So I could, if I parity conjugate that, I'll get this whole formula. OK. Now, this formula suggests something which is actually quite interesting. Remember that chiral SU2 or SU3 is still a symmetry. It's just spontaneously broken by this pair condensation. In the Lagrangian, the left-handed quarks are not connected to the right-handed quarks. When I wrote this vacuum state, I paired up the left-handed up quarks with the left-handed up quark with the right-handed up quarks, and the left-handed down quarks with the left hand with the right-handed down quarks. But there actually wasn't any reason why I couldn't have paired up the left-handed up quarks with the right-handed down quarks. And then I could get some more general structure on the right on the right hand side of this equation. In fact, if I just do a chiral SU3 transformation, then this thing goes to U times Q left. This thing goes to um, U right dagger, if u right dagger, when I wrote this expression, is the opposite, if u right is the opposite of u left, then this entire formula goes to something like this. q left i, q right j is equal to vij times delta, where vij is an SU3 matrix. And in fact, V is exactly equal to U squared. Sorry? Bonds jump to the other key. Uh, no. Uh, oh, sorry. It shouldn't. It should have jumped here. Uh, this would. Oh. Yeah. This. This should be a dagger, and this should not be. And there should be a dagger on this, and I think we're now okay. So, and I got from here to here by doing a symmetry operation. That is something that commutes with the Hamiltonian. So whatever ground state energy I had here, here I have to have the same ground state energy. And so this is actually interesting, but probably from your knowledge of statistical mechanics, completely expected. If I pair condense quarks and antiquarks into the vacuum, then I get not one vacuum, I get a manifold of vacuum states. Those vacuum states are connected by exactly the symmetry that was spontaneously broken. So what spontaneous symmetry breaking means, as you guys know, is that you not only get one vacuum state, but you get a whole manifold of vacuum states. which are connected by the spontaneously broken symmetry. And in fact, what spontaneous symmetry breaking is, is the theory choosing one of those vacua rather than being averaged over all of them. So what is the shape of that manifold? Well, it's exactly the, this is exactly an SU3 matrix. It's exactly the group volume of the SU3 group. If we go back to SU2 for simplicity, you know that the SU2 group is isomorphic to the sphere S3, the unit sphere in four dimensions. So for SU2, 
the vacuum manifold would look exactly like that, a sphere. And for SU3, it would be the kind of more complicated shape of the SU3 group manifold. And as long as we ignore the masses of all the quarks, we could, in principle, be anywhere on that manifold of vacuum states, and we would have exact, exactly the same vacuum energy. OK, well now, again, um, if you guys have taken statistical mechanics from Kadanoff, you know what the next chapter is. Let me choose this choice as my um, canonical location. I can choose any of these vacuum states, but this is a particularly convenient one. Let's develop our nomenclature so that this is the one that's realized in nature. But what I want to do is to act on this state by a chiral SU2, by a local chiral SU2 or SU3 transformation. So I can write e to the i alpha, the integral d3x, uh, the generator uh, J05A, so that's the zero component of this current. And if I acted with that, it would be the charge associated with the symmetry. And I would rotate from this state into one of those other states on this manifold of vacuum states. Instead, what I'd like to do is to write e to the i k dot x here. So now I'm going to do a rotation which is space dependent and which is different at different places in space. So over here I'll rotate this way, over here I'll rotate that way, etc. And I'll set up a wave in space. So let's call this state K. Now the thing I'd like to note for you to notice about this state K is that when I take k to 0, this state becomes a new vacuum state, and it has the same energy as this state. And therefore, the energy of this state, so this state is a wave with wave number k, and its energy, e of k, goes to 0 as k goes to 0. So you've met this before, I think, in this course, this is what you call a Goldstone boson. A massless particle, which basically a particle which you create by doing a local rotation of the orientation of the vacuum. And the mass of that particle must be zero because the energy of the particle goes to zero when the wave number goes to zero. In this theory, we'll have one of these particles for every generator of the spontaneously broken chiral symmetry group. So if you consider massless up and down quarks, let's specialize to that for a moment. We have three generators of SU2, so we have three of these particles. And they form a triplet of, well, let's work out the quantum numbers of these particles. So if I have um, U and D massless, then these particles are basically created in the following way. By acting J05A D3X e to, the minus, e to the IK dot X on the vacuum, they have odd parity. They have isospin equal to 1. And there are three of them, corresponding to the three generators of chiral SU2. And these particles are obviously in one-to-one -one correspondence with the pions, which are an odd parity isotriplet of relatively low mass in the hadron spectrum. If I go to SU3, then I get eight of these particles, all of odd parity. And their quantum numbers are exactly those of pi k and eta. So if I ignore these masses, the pions would be massless. If I ignore the mass of S also, the pions, the kaons, and the eta would be massless.
But frankly, the mass of the pion isn't so big, right? It's m pi over m rho is some, what, it's like one-fifth. And I'm going to argue that what's really important is the square of this number. So that's now getting to be a quite small number. OK. Um, well, now I can do one more thing, which is quite interesting. Let's turn the masses back on. And if I turn the masses back on, this symmetry well, I'm not sure what's going to happen to these symmetries. This symmetry, if I turn all the masses back on and I make the masses equal, this will still be a good symmetry. But if I turn the masses back on, these symmetries will now be explicitly broken. So then it will cost some energy to move from one vacuum state to the other, and the pions will get mass. But what I'd like to do is to compute in perturbation theory in the masses exactly what mass the pions get when I turn on, first of all, the up and down quark masses. So let me do that calculation. Uh, question? OK. Let me do that calculation. So if I turn these masses back on, Yes. That's what I'm trying to argue, yes. Okay. And um, for SU2, chiral SU2, there are three Goldstone bosons. For chiral SU3, there are eight Goldstone bosons. So it always counts right. Okay, so now um, let me remind you of a result from QED. If I compute the divergence of the axial vector current, what I get on this side is 2i times the mass of the fermion times psi bar gamma 5 psi. And so what I would like to do is to repeat this computation in QCD. And I think it's pretty clear you're going to get a similar answer. Um, for the third component, what you're going to get is the, um, let's see. For the third component, what you have here is u bar gamma mu gamma 5 u minus d bar gamma mu gamma 5 d with the 1 half. So then you're going to get mu u bar gamma 5 u minus md d bar gamma 5d. Um, if you look at the structure of this quantity here, you can see that what you have is the masses coupled to some isospin structure. And I think it's not so hard to guess what the answer is for the other components. If this is the guy that creates and destroys the pi zero in this analogy. This guy would create and destroy the pi plus and pi minus. And for that, you get a square root of 2i mu plus md. Um, for the plus here, u bar gamma 5d. So if you just do the computation, what you'll get is that answer. So it's always proportional to the quark masses and with the structure of q bar gamma 5q in some way. Okay. Now, um, let me now take Let me now take the matrix element of this equation, these equations. Um, let me start with this one. Let me take the matrix element of these equations between a one pion state and the vacuum. Okay. 
So the two sides of this equation we're going to treat in the following way. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have the matrix element of the current between a one pi on state and the vacuum. You can ask, I guess, what this can be. There aren't many choices. It's got a vector index, and the only vector around is the momentum of the pion. So this has to be k mu, where k is the momentum of the pion. Um, the vacuum, if I have all the masses zero, is isospin symmetric. So to lowest order in the masses, this has got to be proportional to delta AB for isospin symmetry. And that's more or less the whole structure. The only thing that's missing is that by dimensional analysis, there has to be a parameter here with the dimensions of mass. And that parameter is called f pi. And so conventionally, one writes this formula. Now what about the right-hand side of the equation? The right-hand side of the equation involves something like um, q bar gamma mu t gamma 5 t q between the pi on and the vacuum, pi b. And this is obviously something that, again, is proportional to delta a b. And if I, this guy has odd parity, that guy has odd parity, everything works. What you need here is a factor of dimension mass to the third, or sorry, mass squared. And it can be shown that the right answer here is delta over f pi. So, um, what one can do then is evaluate these. So, let's see, what do I want to have? So, now one can evaluate these formulae in the following way. What you get is if I take the matrix element between the vacuum and a pi on state over here, let's say the pi zero state here, what I'm going to get on this side is f pi times k mu. I've got these indices matching here. The derivative gives me another k mu. On this side of the equation, I have um, ah, and there's an i there. On this side of the equation, I have mu times the trace of, let, let me write this as the trace of MUMD together with the matrix that would represent the pi zero, which is um, this matrix, one minus one of isospin. There's some factors of two that I've been casual with, but I've been casual with them here, one over f pi. So, the result of taking that matrix element, then, is this equation, where on the left-hand side, what I have is k squared times f pi. And on the right-hand side, sorry, there's a minus sign there. There's mu plus md times delta over f pi. And so this is a quite interesting formula. It says that the mass squared of the pion gets a correction linear in the symmetry breaking perturbation. And in fact, we've evaluated that uh, mass in terms of the pion masses. And I claim, because of this connection that I wrote here, the vacuum expectation value of q bar q, which is just the order parameter of chiral symmetry break. So let me write that formula again over here, and we'll think a little more about it. So I claim that m pi squared, this calculation I've done for the pi zero, but it actually goes through for all three pions, is mu plus md times delta over f pi squared. OK, now what are the values of these quantities? Well, delta 
should be something like 300 MeV cubed, something that's roughly the scale of masses of the strong interactions, the mass scale where the coupling constant becomes strong. F pi, we're going to evaluate in tomorrow's lecture, I think. And the value is 92 MeV. <laughs> and the pi on mass is 135 MeV or so. And if you just plug in those numbers, what you find out is that this number over here is 6 MeV. Well, that's a totally startling number. Because what it says is that almost nothing of the mass of hadrons that contain the up and the down quark comes from the up and the down quark. It's all coming from other things. In particular, the dynamics of this quark binding by QCD and the spontaneous symmetry breaking and the interaction of things with this pair condensate in the vacuum. If we apply this to the proton, we would say that only a few MeV of the proton mass is coming from the masses, the fundamental masses of the up and down quarks. And most of it is coming from the fact that those quarks are swimming around in this soup of quarks and antiquarks. But nevertheless, let's go on and derive more of these formulae. If I generalize this, yes, please. Right. So, like that gap, let's continue oh. and we'll see. Okay. So if I continue, um, I can get more formulae for the masses of other. So if I now take U, D, and S all light, I can get formulae for the masses of the other of the octet of um, pseudoscalar mesons. So for example, mk plus, it obeys a formula of the same type, mu plus ms times delta over f pi squared. mk0 is mu plus md over f pi squared. And the mass of the eta has a formula, which I'd probably better look up, uh, 4ms plus mu plus md, or, yeah, that's right, over 3 times delta over f pi squared. Now, um, yes? Oh, sorry. I, okay. I just thought that the um, MU plus MU was in the denominator under 6 MEV there, but it's not. No, six it's MEV. always in the numerator. Okay. We're doing first order perturbation <laughs> theory. <laughs> that's, that's good. Okay. Um, and also, where do you get those numbers from? Are these just measurements? Okay, so this one I'll, I have to explain to you tomorrow. Um, this one, you can measure the mass. This is actually just an estimate, although maybe with lattice gauge theory. Uh, simulations you can refine that. Order. But what I'm saying is that the, the order of magnitude should be the um, mass scale of strong interactions. Yes? Uh, are all the F, uh, F parameters should be the same? Ah, uh, yes, because the F parameters come from this equation, which is an equation in the limit where the masses are all zero. So if the masses are all zero, there's SU3 symmetry. And that relates the F. Now, in reality, the F for the K is about 10% larger than the F for the pi. But it doesn't have a big effect on this. OK. So um, whatever the value of delta is, if you look at the masses for pi k, k0, for pi k and k0, there are, um, there are three masses. Uh, if we take out the overall scale, there are two mass ratios, and there are two ratios of parameters. So from that, you can actually work out the ratios of what the fundamental masses in the Lagrangian are for U, D, and S. 
And the results are slightly surprising. It's MD over MU is approximately equal to 2. And MS over MD is approximately equal to 20. So if you um, take this estimate of 6 MeV seriously, you would have MU is about 2 MeV, MD is about 4 MeV, and MS is about 80 MeV. And if you think about the strange quark as dressed somehow inside a baryon, I told you that the strange quark contributes an extra mass of about 120 to 150 MeV inside hadrons. Maybe that's not so inconsistent with this number. But the real surprise is these ratios, right? Um, the strange quark is much, much heavier than the down quark fundamentally or than the up quark. And in fact, this ratio tells you that at the level of the QCD Lagrangian, isospin is not a symmetry at all. It's just totally broken. The up and the down quark have masses that differ by a factor of two. The reason that isospin appears to be a good symmetry in nature is that those masses, whatever they are, are much smaller than the scale of masses that's generated by the spontaneous symmetry breaking associated with the pair condensation into the vacuum. Oh, by the way, there's also the eta here. And if I take the eta into account, then I get a one more relation, which is 2mk plus squared plus uh, mk0 squared is equal to 3m eta squared plus m pi 0 squared, or m pi squared. This relation, which is extra compared to everything I've discussed here, just follows from the bottom formula. It's called the Gelman-Akubo formula. Um, in nature, if you just plug in the mass values, I think, oh, uh, sorry, I wrote it in my notes for the mass of the eta. We predict that the mass of the eta should be um, 567 MeV, just using that formula. The actual value is 548. So you don't do so badly in taking this to be the mass formula for the eta. Now, you remember when I discussed the hadron spectrum, I explained that the hadrons spectra of the pseudoscalar mesons was kind of mixed up with respect to the mass spectrum of all the other nonets and baryon multiplets. All those had even spacing when I added strange quarks. But for the pseudoscalar mesons, there was a different pattern which we had to explain. Well, now I think we understand it completely. The pseudoscalar mesons are Goldstone bosons. And the fact that they're Goldstone bosons and this little perturbation theory exercise completely explains their mass spectra in terms of these values of the fundamental quark masses. OK. Well, now, once you've decided that the pseudoscalar mesons are Goldstone bosons, there are all kinds of other neat things that follow, which can actually be tested in the real strong interactions. Um, I'm going to skip the next one that's in the notes, though you folks might want to read it. There's a relation that follows from chiral SU2 called the goldberger treeman relation. Which relates the following very non-intuitive set of quantities. The quantity called G sub A, which appears in neutron beta decay, it's the coefficient of the axial vector term in neutron beta decay, which has the value 1.25. F pi, which we've discussed, the mass of the nucleon, the mass of the proton and neutron, and G pi n n, 
which is the um, coupling constant, the phenomenological coupling constant for a proton or neutron to couple to a pion. The value of this quantity, it, this is an extremely large number. It's actually 13.3. And if you plug in the numbers, um, Please excuse me. Yeah, if you plug in the numbers, uh, this side of the formula predicts G sub A is equal to 1.3. So the fact that there should be a relation like that, it's very counterintuitive. Goldberger and Treeman derived this relation in the 50s using a, a really stupid model in which um, the proton had a fundamental coupling to pions and then you could model the coupling of weak interactions to the proton using that uh, interaction. And they found this result, and then they plugged in the numbers, and they noticed that it was basically perfect. And it was not until many years later that people understood that that's a consequence of the pions being Goldstone bosons. And how, why that happens, you can read about in the notes. However, there's one more consequence of this picture of the pions and cans being Goldstone bosons. Let me just concentrate on the pions for the moment, which I would like to discuss for you because it's, it's really kind of amazing. So what if I wanted to discuss the interaction of pions with one another? Pions are strongly interacting particles. And so what you're tempted to do is write some kind of interactions for pions where they exchange other pions, maybe rho mesons or something like that, and they have strong interactions. So is it possible to calculate the cross-section for pion-pion scattering um, without knowing all the details of this interaction? Well, it turns out that it is. And here's the logic. What I'd like to do is to write a Lagrangian for pion-pion interactions um, let me f uh, now really go to the limit where the pions are, where mu and md are zero and the pions are massless. I'd like to, in that limit, write a Lagrangian for the nonlinear part of the pion pion interaction based on the Goldstone boson picture. And to do that, what I'd like to do is to choose as my basic variable this quantity v that characterizes the local vacuum rate. So let me write V is equal to the I pi TA, where pi is the pion field. Um, so now V is a unitary SU2 matrix. So what I'd like to do is to write a Lagrangian in terms of V. It's an obvious thing to do because V is a dynamical variable that tells me what the local vacuum orientation is at any point in space. So let's start writing that Lagrangian. Um, that Lagrangian is strongly constrained because it has to be symmetric under the full symmetry of the theory, namely SU2 cross SU2. So it has to have a global symmetry which is V of X goes to U left, V of X, U right dagger. So that's highly constraining on what the Lagrangian for V is. Um, here's one thing you can write. D mu V dagger, D mu V. Uh, v is dimensionless, so to get the dimensions right, uh, you have to put some quantity with the dimensions of mass squared in front of it. OK. Um, now, what else can we write? Well, in principle, we could write a mass term, like the trace of V dagger V. But unfortunately, V dagger V is 1. So there actually isn't any non-derivative term you can write. The next term you can write, preserving this exact symmetry, has four derivatives. It's something like the trace of d mu v dagger d mu v uh, d nu v. Well, we could write this. 
Or there's one more ordering of derivatives. So there are actually two terms like that. But they all have four derivatives in them. So if the dimensions, so then we need some dimensionless factor in front of that. If this guy is at the scale of the strong interactions, this guy will be very important until we get to rather high energies above the pion mass. We could also, if you like, include a mass term. In fact, the appropriate mass term is just the one that I had over here, um, the trace of MV plus Hermitian conjugate. And that kind of term, some constant goes in front of it, will also give you uh, the behavior that I discussed over there, the pion masses when you add a mass perturbation. The pion mass squareds are linear in the quark masses. OK. Well, now let me tell you something about this Lagrangian. So four derivatives plus order of masses. So up to mass terms, there's actually a unique Lagrangian with a single parameter. And this Lagrangian is nonlinear because I can expand it in powers of pi. I get nonlinear interactions. It describes low energy pi on pi on interactions. Now you can do the following thing. You can work out the symmetry current of chiral SU2. And you can compare to the formula that I used over here that the matrix element of the symmetry current in the one pi on state should be F pi k mu delta AB. So that exercise is done in the notes. And what you find is that F here is actually F pi. Maybe we should put an F pi here uh, to correctly normalize the kinetic energy term. And now we're done. Now we can just put that into here, expand it out, and get a Lagrangian for pions that includes interactions. d mu pi a, d mu pi a. That's the first term. And then what you find is the following term. i over f pi squared times a very specific structure. Um, let's see. Um, times a very specific structure. It's got a 1 over f pi squared, because there's an f pi and a 1 over f pi to the fourth four pions, A, B, C, D, and some specific structure, which is a function of momenta. It's got two momenta in it. And what I have in my notes is the matrix element that follows from that. So let me write that down. It's actually not so hard an exercise to compute this matrix element. So this is the matrix element for pion pion scattering that follows from that Lagrangian. And it's i over f pi squared times delta ab delta cd times s minus m pi squared, if you put the pi on masses back, plus ac bd t minus m pi squared, plus delta ad delta bc u minus m pi squared, plus order um, momentum to the fourth power. These are all momentum squared. OK. Well, that's incredibly cool. We got the formula for pi on pi on scattering at low energies with no free parameters. The only parameter in this expression is f pi squared, which, as I've told you, you can determine in some totally independent way. So you, now, this formula is complicated because it has all these indices, but we can break that down in the following way. That there are three channels, if you think about pi on pi on scattering. The isospin can be 0, 1, or 2. In isospin 0, this predicts a strongly attractive interaction. In isospin 1, this Lagrangian predicts a weakly attractive interaction. And in isospin 2, it predicts a strongly repulsive interaction. And then you can go measure pion-pion scattering. 
Um, the way you do that typically is you have a proton. You consider a process where um, a diagram like this so you consider pi on proton scattering, and you look for a regime where a diagram like this will be the dominant diagram. Or there are ways to extract it from weak interaction decays. So in the slides, I put some of the data on this. And so if you go to the slides, you see, uh, first of all, the um, extraction of the pi on pi on scattering amplitude, or rather the phase shift, in the um, isospin 0, L equals 0 state. And you see there's a large positive phase shift. It's strongly attractive. Um, in the second slide, what you see is the extraction of the phase shift in I equals 1, L equals 1. Um, the prediction of this theory is the, is the shallow slope when the thing begins from threshold. And you see that that curve is uh, in relatively good agreement with it, although maybe the data is sparse. On the next page, um, what you see is a refinement of these two. Uh, the, I think the difference between these two phase shifts measured at very low energy in K-on decays. Once again, the curve is this zero-parameter theory, or at least the part of the curve near threshold is this zero-parameter theory. And it's in fantastic agreement with the data. And then finally, the last plot shows an extraction of the I equals 2, L equals 0 phase shift. It's large and negative, a strongly repulsive scattering. And once again, the slope is in fantastic agreement with that formula. So oddly, one can actually say things about the strong part of the strong interactions using absolutely first principles, using this principle of chiral symmetry and the pions as Goldstone bosons of a spontaneous symmetry break. So this all, it seems to me, is very strong evidence that the QCD Lagrangian is actually the right one. And so now what I propose to do is just run with it. And so tomorrow we'll start talking about a different aspect of the standard model, the weak interactions. Okay? Thank you.